Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, it's certainly an honor to be here. My family came from Bath, Maine, so we certainly have roots in this area, and we're, we're happy to be here. I wrote a book. Um, I wrote a book and submitted it to the publisher in July of last year. About a week later, I got a call from the publisher that said, Agus, Steve Jobs just called and changed the title of your book. I'm like, what? He did what? And he said, I had called it, What is Health? Because that's the key question to me. Is it your cholesterol? Is it how you look? Is it how you feel? I didn't know how to define health. And to me, that was an important concept because unless you have something on which to optimize, how do you make a system better? And I said, first thing is, I called Steve. I said, Steve, why would you call the publisher and not me? He said, it's their job to market the book, not yours. And then I said, well, why did you change the title? He said, if you put the word health in the title, it turns people off. If you use the word health, their eyes start to roll back. Health is a bad word in our country. And I said, OK. And the title now is, uh, uh, is aggressive. It's declaratory. And it's certainly something I'm going to believe in. Because if you look at it, this is what Mark Twain said a long time ago, is that the only way to keep your health is eat what you don't want, drink what you don't like, and do what you'd rather not. <laughs> well, I'm here to tell you that that's not the case. And the data we have, I think, are dramatically different. Most of the time, we're just not listening. But the key is, again, what is the metric? In the United States last year, we spent almost $2 billion in people who were non-short stature to give them growth hormone. Why? Because if I took a 70-year-old and I gave them growth hormone, they're going to look better, they're going to feel better. Their friends are going to go up to them and say, what happened to you? You look fantastic. They're going to live, on average, 13 years shorter but they're going to look better. In fact, there's a paper in Science last year where they found this remarkable population in Ecuador that had a mutation in that growth hormone receptor. So there's short stature. In this population of over 20,000 people, there is no cancer and no diabetes. Yet we as a culture give these because we care about today and not tomorrow. The key metric is, do you want to play with your grandkids or do you want to look good today? And the hope is there's a compromise. But most of the time, people don't know what's going on. They don't know what really the long-term outcome is. The way you end illness, the way you do better in healthcare in our country, the goal is to live until our 90s. The way we do that is we avoid disease. The way we do that is we focus on prevention, which is data we have today. The paradox? <laughs> is that in, eight, in, in this country, nine, uh, 83 years old, is the year upon we don't put people in intensive care unit when they hit 83. We don't put them on ventilators and do these crazy expensive things that don't lengthen life. We actually let them do something that the last year you can do this was 1954 in this country, which is die of old age. That's the last year that old age can be caused of death on a death certificate. I want to go back to dying of old age. And I'll show you some of the simple ways that we've learned to do that. But first, I want you to know where I'm coming from. I believe that we screwed up in medicine because of something that happened in the 1940s called germ theory. Germ theory said, you know the bacteria, you know the treatment, right? It came about because somebody put moist bread, a clinical trial, on somebody's leg with a wound. And it healed twice as fast is if you let it open to the air, right? When bread gets mold, it makes antibiotics. It makes what is the equivalent of penicillin, and it actually allows things to heal better. And so the old days, you identify what you're up against, it works. That, back that antibiotic didn't care if you were short, round, fat, tall, green, yellow, blue, it didn't matter. You gave the right antibiotic, you would cure the patient. The problem with most diseases is they come from within, not without, right? We are a complex emergent system. So it's your body intersecting with itself. So once you make the diagnosis, cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, that doesn't mean you know the treatment at all because it's not a bacteria. It's the body with itself. It is that complex system. You've got inputs, your DNA, what you eat, how you exercise, who your spouse is. The output is how you feel. Well, that middle state function Throughout history, it's been hidden. 
for the first time now through technology, we can start to see it. And the, the wild part is a complex emergent system is almost impossible to truly understand. We know it's the case in human beings because we're learning a new dimension to health literally every quarter or two. Six months ago, we learned about the microbiome that we never heard of before. Last month, we realized junk DNA isn't junk anymore. It actually is DNA that controls other things. And we're gonna keep learning those new dimensions. But the good news is a complex emergent system can be controlled without understanding. My 12-year-old, you say, how do you stop a train? He says, you pull the brakes. He doesn't say, what's the track made of? What's the temperature? What's the uh, train speed? He just says, you pull the brakes. That weather forecaster, climate forecaster, looks at the shape of the clouds, the temperature, the wind speed, and they are damn good at predicting what's going to happen. I want doctors to be like weather forecasters and not biologists. Our notion of trying to understand from a reductionist level on up isn't working. There's a problem there. And so remember, take what I say somewhat with a grain of salt. I'm the same profession that said this. I'm the same profession that did this and this and this. I love this on the top there. It says, lady with a lamp. I am the same profession that about 25, 30 years ago said, take margarine, not butter. And if you look at the epidemiologic data, we killed over two million people by saying that. So we are so good at these declaratory statements with no data behind them. And I think it's really scary. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples now where I think give you a sense of where I'm coming from. So if I ask you, you know, what's your exercise program? Most of you say, I spent an hour at the gym or I put a DVD in and I did calisthenics or whatever you do. What the data show is the following. This is a paper from 1954 that was published by Jeremiah Morris that nobody quoted for 40 years. He did something that in healthcare we dream of, right? He was able to go to the 26,000 workers of the British Transit Authority and just pull their health records. There were no privacy laws. There was no HIPAA. He could do whatever he wanted. And he pulled those records, and what he showed was there were two class of workers. There were the bus drivers who sat 90% of the day and drove the buses. There were those ticket takers who walked up and down those double-decker buses and took the tickets. Same body mass index between both groups, same weight, similar environments they lived in. They married people of similar socioeconomic backgrounds, same tobacco habits, everything remarkably similar. Yet, there was about 70% less heart disease and 40% less cancer in the take-it-takers. The problem is we as a society have built a society of bus drivers. Our buildings are engineered so that you park right next to where you work. Your printer's right next to your computer. The bathrooms are on every floor. We encourage you to sit. But look at the data. Sitting for five to six hours a day has the equivalent health impact of smoking a pack and a quarter of cigarettes. Sitting for five to six hours has the same impact as smoking a pack and a quarter of cigarettes. Yet that is what we do. I want buildings in the future. We have LEED certification for how they affect the environment. I want health certification. I want buildings designed so that the printers are three floors away, the parking spots are five buildings away, that we encourage you to get up, that you have meetings where you actually do something called walking. And you get together and you walk along the street for a meeting. It's a sign of respect. It's a sign you care about your employees. You know, this is a device that looks at how much I move during the day. It's powerful. I realized I was sitting on my computer all day. I got one of those phones where I look like an air traffic controller, but now I can walk when I talk on the phone. There are companies now that say to their employees, if you walk or move 25% of the day, I'm going to give you a discount at the company store. And they're doing that not because they want to be cool. They're doing that because there's a return on investment. Companies are self-insured. If they can reduce heart disease and cancer, one heart attack is $80,000 to the bottom line of a company. One case of colon cancer is over $240,000 to a company. There's a return on investment there that's powerful. And so 1974, Monsanto, in their annual report, estimated $150 million to sequence one gene. 
Well, when I launched the book, we did three successive nightlines. And Bill Weir, the nightline anchor, came into my office, 41-year-old, healthy guy, young kid. And he comes in, and live on TV, I sequence his DNA. And that costs pennies. I showed he was high risk for heart disease. So based on that, live on TV, we got a scan of his heart that showed a blockage in one of the big arteries going on his heart. He called it the story that saved his life. The next morning, the American Heart Association, actually, Tuesday night, we're doing a repeat night line based on the reactions. You could see, to hear about what we're talking about today. But he, uh, the American Heart Association said, egg is screwed up. Bill Weir wasn't eligible for screening. I said, are you serious? Then your criteria are wrong. And they said, if everybody in our country had a heart scan, by the way, a heart scan costs $79, everybody had a heart scan, there would be chaos. And so I said, then you need to be lobbying Congress for better technology, technology that doesn't have radiation, more scalable technology, not saying we don't need to save people's lives because the playing field has to change. Well, this is me, right? This is me where I spit into a tube, and then a couple days later, I talked to a genetic counselor, and it told me my DNA. And so in all full disclosure, this is a company we founded called Navigenics. But what it does is it told me what I'm up against. And it was somewhat of a religious moment, more than I thought. But I started to learn about me and where to focus on prevention. Why? Because prevention matters. There are five large randomized studies that the results of which, if everybody in our country over the age of 40 spent $3.80 a year, we would save over $90 billion in healthcare costs. They show that taking an aspirin a day, a baby aspirin, for over six years reduced the rate of metastatic cancer by 36%, reduced the death of cancer by over a quarter. And by the way, death is a bad side effect. <laughs> so you look at this dramatic data in that regard. Really overwhelming, yet most people don't do it. I want to know why it's optional. I want to know why healthcare is 17% of gross domestic product in this country, and yet we're not mandating the preventive things. Statins, this class of drug that was developed to lower cholesterol, turns out to block inflammation. So this class of drug, if you give it to somebody with a normal cholesterol, with high inflammation, you'll delay heart attack and stroke by years. When I talk about this in prevention, on the internet, there are all these chat groups and, and Amazon people put up all this stuff saying, he's a shill for the drug company, he's pushing pills. How much does a 90-day supply of statins cost at Walmart without health insurance? Without health insurance, $9. A year of aspirin, three and a half dollars. So you look at those things, dramatic effects where these can reduce or delay heart attack and stroke by a decade reduce cancer statins by 20%, and yet we're not using them in most people. Look at the other side, vitamins equal life. I don't know if any of you saw the front page of the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, USA Today yesterday. There was about a study, and it said that people who took a multivitamin day, this is a physician study, multivitamin day had an 8% reduction in cancer. I went on the morning talk shows yesterday because nobody read the paper, they just read the press release. In the paper, it actually said that in people who went into the study with no cancer and healthy, there was no benefit to multivitamins. The only benefit was seen in people who had prior cancer. And in that, it was very you know, wishy-washy because some people benefited, some people didn't, and it could harm, as I'll show you. Yet the press got it all wrong. Every headline was that it benefited everybody. 19 years, they studied over 30,000 women who took multivitamins versus not. The women who took the multivitamins, this wasn't randomized. They went into the study, they cared about their health. They were skinnier, they had lower BMI, lower blood pressure, less diabetes, yet there was a 15% higher death rate in the women who took the multivitamins. So it's a little cause for, hey, take a step back. On the internet now, these are headlines of vitamin D. According to the internet, it could do everything. In fact, when I speak now, there are vitamin D lobbies out there picketing because I'm against taking supplemental vitamin D. Why? Because I look at the data. If over 90% of African Americans and 75% of Caucasians are low in vitamin D, first of all, who defined what normal was? If we have this new epidemic of low vitamin D, why are hip fracture rates down 40% over the last decade? Interesting. But remember, you're measuring one node of a network. There's the receptor, 
We're not measuring, that's where it binds. And then the signaling molecules, we're not measuring them either. In fact, the country of Canada several years ago had to outlaw vitamin D testing because it was 11% of their laboratory budget for the country. So does it help? Well, they took women over 70 and they gave them high dose vitamin D and it increased, increased the rate of bone fractures by 26%. Little cause for alarm. So based on this and other data, about six weeks ago, the US government issued new data, new alarm that nobody in this country, women, men should take calcium or vitamin D. Remember, in the women's health study, women who took calcium and vitamin D versus placebo, there was no change of bone fracture rate at all. Osteoporosis, low bone density, is not a deficiency in calcium and vitamin D. It's a genetic trait of which we know the genes that's actually selected for in evolution. Evolution liked women with smaller bones because it was easier to go through childbirth. And yet, we start just giving these supplements. We spend more in our country on supplements than in all of medical research without data. Select study, quarter billion dollar study by our government, taking 35,000 almost men and giving them vitamin E versus placebo. It had to be halted at year three because there was a 17% increase in prostate cancer in the men who took the vitamin E. And it lasted for three years after stopping. 63 randomized studies done in history with vitamins, multivitamins versus placebo to prevent heart disease and cancer, none, not, none yet have ever been positive in a person without disease as a preventive strategy. In fact, then the naysayers say, well, listen, the incidence of disease is so low on a yearly basis in an average person. Take smokers and former smokers, and let's give them beta carotene and vitamin A, high dose antioxidants, and see what happens. What happened was a 17% higher death rate and 28% more lung cancer in the people who took the supplements versus not. Yet we're doing it. 1976, if you or your spouse thought they were pregnant, we took a tube of blood, we went to a hospital, because this test could only be done at a hospital, and we injected a rabbit. If the rabbit's ovaries were enlarged five days later after you killed the rabbit, you were pregnant. Well, 1977, Warner Shulka comes out with a $10 binary test saying pregnant not. Well, this was the first proteomics test ever. Well, rabbits of the world rejoiced. <laughs> and at the same time, we dramatically changed maternal health, neonatal health by one simple proteomic test. We now have the technology to look at all the proteins in the body so we can actually say what's going on a moment in time. Remember, if you're in front of two Chinese restaurants and you look at the ingredient list, they're exactly the same. You taste the food, one could be great and one could be poor. Well, DNA is your ingredient list what's going on a moment in time, how the food tastes, that's things like proteomics, microbiomics. You have tenfold more bacteria in your body than you do cells in the body. These bacteria control your metabolism, your hormone level, your risk for disease. Somebody from China has a tenth of the breast and prostate cancer we do. After they move to the United States, it starts to equal our risk after 10 years. We said, it's the Burger King and McDonald's. It's not, it's they adopt our bacteria. For the first time ever, about six months ago, we actually quantified and qualified them through sequencing. Going forward, I guarantee you, this is one of the ways we modulate disease because this is a way we can change the system that's you or I. So I, I wanna end now, and you know, I, I've been a little bit all over the place, but I wanna give you a sense that we are this complex system. I wanna give you a sense that we have to take a call to action in our country about health and take stands. This week in Fortune, we have an article where we claim that the only health hero over the last decade, the only health leader over the last decade is the mayor of New York City. The mayor of New York City said, trans fats are bad. I'm gonna create a nanny state, as people called it. And it worked, it created discussion. So if somebody from New York City goes to the suburbs and goes to a supermarket, whether they're poor or they're rich, it changed their behavior. Because remember, what is the greatest thing to happen to stem cells in this country? President Bush. So without President Bush, nobody would know what stem cells are. Today, everybody knows what they are when you walk on the street of any city in this country. And the reason is discourse. We have to create the discourse. So I thank you.